Imagine the courage of a young black man in the Jim Crow South to sit at a whites-only lunch counter, to need a military escort for a bus ride, to be assaulted by the Ku Klux Klan, and through it all to remain committed to nonviolence. He's Bernard Lafayette, this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. Alongside me is my friend and co-host, G. Wayne Miller from the Providence Journal. Each week, we sit down with storytellers, scholars, and activists to understand the stories that shape America. This week, we're joined by Bernard Lafayette, a hero of the civil rights movement whose lifelong commitment to nonviolence is an inspiration. Bernard, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. So um, there's so much that we want to talk to you about, and, and it's unfortunately only a 30-minute show, but I, I wonder if we could start with uh, sort of what made you an activist. You were at the uh, American Baptist Theological Seminary in Nashville. Had you been an activist before then? What, 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 what drew you to it? The thing that really uh, motivated me to be involved in the movement actually was my grandmother. Uh, we were riding a, a streetcar, and in those days, back in the 40s, I was only about seven years old in 1947, and my grandmother and I used to work uh, very closely together. I used to, like, be on her dress tail, so to speak, and I learned a lot. We were uh, traveling, and we used to have to uh, board the streetcar and some people call it a cable car, because it did have a cable. And we would uh, put the money in the receptacle, get off, and then walk to the back of the, uh, you know, the streetcar on the streets next to the tracks. Not even go up the center aisle. No, because they had a rubberized curtain in the back that separated the whites from the blacks. So that back door was the entrance for blacks. So, sometime the conductor would take off with the money after you put the money in while you were walking on the street. So we used to run. And I used to run ahead and jump on the steps because if you jump on the steps, you can keep the doors open. And then even if it's moving, passengers could jump. So here I was doing my little thing and my grandmother fell. Oh my goodness, she fell that smack, her heel got caught in the cracks, you know, the bricks around the track. Mm -hmm. And she was a very large woman. And I was trying to reach for her and trying to reach for the door. I felt like a sword had cut me in half. And I remember at age seven, I said this to myself, when I get grown, I'm gonna do something about this problem. I couldn't wait to get grown. So my motivation for getting involved in the movement was really so my grandmother could have a, a better life for the few years she had left to live. And that, so it couldn't happen fast enough for me. And that story is a microcosm of, of the Jim Crow South, right? Yes. And um, so when you, got to, when you got to college and you got to Nashville, uh, one of your classmates uh, was, was John Lewis, but it wasn't just John Lewis and you. There was a community of people uh, who were uh, uh, committed to change, but you, 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 you discovered early nonviolence. Uh, talk to us about how that became part of, of, your, of your activism. Well, uh, I grew up um, in the South, but I was also grew up in the... Uh, in the church. So I had listened to a lot of the, um, you know, theology of love and that sort of thing, et cetera. And so that was very common uh, with me. Hadn't applied it to social issues of the day, 
but the whole idea of being able to to love people and be nice to people and that sort of thing is part of my upbringing. But when I got to uh, the seminary there, American Baptist Theological Seminary, I was very fortunate because my homiletics teacher was uh, Kelly Miller Smith, Sr., and he was head of the SCLC chapter, Southern Christian Leadership chapter, okay? It's called the Nashville Christian uh, Movement there, okay? And um, my history teacher, uh, biblical history teacher, was the head of the state NAACP, and even uh, Reverend C.T. Vivian used to substitute for the homiletics class. So we had law leaders there who were very much actively involved. And then Jim Lawson came and started holding these workshops. Well, to be honest with you, at first I wasn't interested because I was so busy. I was a librarian and I was a janitor, the second floor. And so John Lewis was trying to get me to come and go to these workshops. I said, man, I'm too busy. I don't have time to go to any workshops. <laughs> <laughs> I've got my classes, you know. And uh, with all these jobs I had, I always had a lot of jobs. And so he said, I, saw, I said, okay, I'm going to go and just uh, so I could shut his mouth. I could talk. <laughs> <laughs> I could say that, you know, I did go and thank you very much, you know, and now, you know. But I got hooked when I got to those classes and I began to see this in a broader framework and talking about Mahatma Gandhi and bringing in uh, some of the concepts that uh, I'd grown up with and then uh, plotting the social action. Well, when you put these two things together and then talk about change and changing these conditions, which that's what I wanted to do, oh, I was hooked. No problem. I went to all of those workshops and I went to Howl in the Folk School and uh, just the whole thing. It was, I was in the first city there in Nashville, no question about it. And I was uh, one of those who uh, gave my uh, leadership to it. Yes. So you engaged in sit ins and other demonstrations. Was there a fear of violence being committed against you? And, and your colleagues in, in these actions by the KKK or white supremacists or other people. I mean, it was a very contentious time in, in Southern and in, in U.S. history. Yes, and uh, there was the fear, but the training we got in the nonviolence uh, workshops gave us a way to respond to the fear within and also how to respond to the violence that was perpetrated. And that's why it's so valuable in terms of the training that Jim Lawson gave us. And uh, Martin Luther King himself went through that kind of training as well. So this equips you now with the tools and uh, the resources that you need to be able to combat because it's not an idea of nonviolence just being beaten and doing nothing. No, you are doing very active resistance because you are showing the person a different way. In fact, you're showing the person how you would prefer being treated by treating that person that way in a loving response. Because you see, people are dealing with problems and when you uh, are confronted, the question is whether you want to be part of the problem or part of the solution. That's the decision you have to make. And when you make that decision, then you can uh, feel empowered. And that's how you can help bring about change. But it's not the individual, it's a system. That person is part of a larger system. And that's where we have to mobilize a large number of people and began to have strategies for social change. And many of the people that we initially confronted, those people have made changes as well. You were a freedom rider. Yes. Talk about that. What was that like? And again, we're talking in the early, early 1960s, that era of the civil rights movement. Yes. 
Well, the freedom rides originally started uh, by CORE, Congress of Racial Equality, out of Washington, D.C., and the destination was New Orleans. I applied, and John Lewis applied, we both did. We we're going to go on the original ride. Uh, and John Lewis was 21 uh, that uh, February, but I wouldn't be 21 until July. So I had to get parental permission. If you're not 21, you had to get parental permission. So I did. I sent the papers to my parents and asked them, you know, go ahead and sign those papers and send them back right away. Well, I didn't get any response, so I called, and I called on the phone, and my fa I asked my father had he received them. He said, uh, yes, he did. And I said, uh, well, could you just sign them, send them back right away? I'm trying to meet a deadline. I was the first one to go to college in my family, so I thought he might associate it with going to college, you know, and papers you fill out. He said, do you think I didn't read it? And I said to myself, I was hoping he didn't read it. <laughs> just, <laughs> just signed the paper. I said, could you just sign it and send it? And his sober, somber response was, I'm not going to sign your death warrant. Mm -hmm. That was his interpretation of going on freedom rides. So I didn't go on the original ride. Once the ride was halted by the violence in Anniston, Alabama and Birmingham, where people were beaten and uh, arrested, uh, taken out to the state line and that sort of thing, um, we decided we would continue in Nashville. And the reason why the Nashville group decided to take up the Freedom Rides and continue it was for, well, three basic reasons. One, John Lewis was on the original ride, and he knew the pattern, he knew the schedule, he had the contacts of the people who would meet you in different cities as you would go along, that sort of thing. Uh, so we had information. The second thing is, which is unbeknownst, it's not in the history books uh, as often as it should be, was that we had already desegregated the bus station in Nashville. The Greyhound bus station was desegregated in 1960 hmm. before the Freedom Ride started because we were sitting in downtown at the lunch counters and there happens to be a lunch counter at the bus station downtown. So we included that in our sit-in movement. So we desegregated the Greyhound bus station when we desegregated the lunch counters. So we had that victory even before SNCC was formed when we went to the Raleigh, North Carolina at Shaw University. So a person could ride all the way from Virginia on a segregated bus, a Greyhound bus got to Nashville, got off in an integrated uh, bus station. And uh, then you'd get back on a segregated bus and go all the way to Montgomery, Alabama and go to a segregated bus station on a segregated bus. But the local people who were going to take a bus went to the bus station on an integrated local bus because of the Montgomery bus boycott. Mm. So there were cracks in the system. That's the point I want to make. And so that gave us the evidence and, the con uh, and be able to convince us that things could change. We did not go expecting to uh, just protest and see how bad it is. We join that movement to change the conditions. And that's what that's the difference between direct action, protest, and a nonviolent movement. And that's what Martin Luther King was about. Let's take a quick moment for station identification. This is Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. You can hear an audio version of this show four times each weekend on Sirius XM's popular Politics of the United States. That's the POTUS channel, number 124. We produce the show with a tremendous team at Rhode Island PBS, and we know how lucky we are to work with them. I'm Jim Lutis, the executive director of the Pell Center at Salve Regina University in beautiful Newport, Rhode Island. I'd love to hear from you on Twitter. You can find me at... J.M. Lutus. 
My co-host is an award-winning journalist with the Providence Journal and the author of 17 books so far. He's G. Wayne Miller, and you can find him on Twitter, too, at G. Wayne Miller. And our guest this week is a minister, an educator, and one of the world's great proponents of nonviolent protest, Bernard Lafayette. Uh, I want to ask you, um, there are so many uh, uh, ministers uh, involved in the American Civil Rights Movement in the 1960s. Uh, and, and we talk about story and the power of story in, in public life. Scripture and the stories, b biblical stories, uh, were part of the movement. Can you speak about the power, whether we're talking about scripture or we're talking about music, and the power of those different kinds of storytelling in the American Civil Rights Movement? Yes. Uh, the role of the uh, faith community played an important uh, uh, power in the change that took place because there are many examples of where love overpowers hate and uh, the light of truth drives out the darkness of falsehood. And we have many of those examples throughout our scripture. And we only had to apply it to the social conditions that we were faced with in the 60s, particularly in the South. But there, was, there were problems in the North as well. And I don't mind speaking to that. But um, <clears throat> these were laws that were on the books. And it was important for us to uh, use all the sources that we could. And the, the scriptures and those teachings were very important. Uh, even like for example, when uh, Peter, you know, cut the ear off one of the soldiers who were about to attack, he said, no, Peter, put away your sword, okay? And he put the ear back on, whatever the story says there. And uh, the reason I was smiling is because I was talking to a minister one time about uh, his weapon. And I said, well, we don't think it's necessary to carry a gun because, you know, you actually are armed with truth and love, which is a much more powerful force. And he said, well, uh, I don't know. I might not, you know, use it, but... It, uh, and remember, uh, Jesus didn't tell Peter to throw away his gun. He said, just put it away. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, I had to deal with that fact. Uh, but at the same time, we wanted to uh, tell him that he had a greater force than his, than his weapon. So, so tell us about your long association with Martin Luther King Jr., how you met him and you were with him until the very last day of his life. Yes, um, that was one of the most, uh, oh my goodness, this, well, lexicographers haven't invented words yet to describe my uh, feeling about Martin Luther King. So fortunate. Well, the first time I met him actually was in Nashville. He came and spoke to our Nashville group after we had desegregated the lunch counters. And he said, I came not to bring inspiration. I came to gain inspiration because he was really impressed with what we had been able to accomplish. And we certainly admired him as our hero. And that was my first uh, uh, contact with him. Uh, later on, uh, as we went along through the uh, movement and we formed, uh, we had the Freedom Riots, of course, and I met him there when we were in the church uh, in um, Montgomery, Alabama. And, you know, we were trying to decide whether, uh, how we were going to continue the Freedom Riots after we had been beaten up at the bus station and that kind of thing, et cetera. So, and many way, many times along the way, I met Martin Luther King, had a chance to talk to him and that kind of thing. But um, he was observing me all the time, and I didn't know it. So moving ahead real fast, um, once I got the Selma movement off the ground, I used that uh, Selma movement for several things. One is that, unbeknownst to a lot of people, there is a person carrying the American flag with a beret on that's 
backwards. It's a black beret, and he's right in front of Martin Luther King. Some of the photos you might see. Now, that's Lamar McCoy. He was head of the vice lords in Chicago. So I went to Chicago and started training gang members because the American Friends Service Committee wanted to do nonviolence up north. So they recruited me, and I said, fine. We got the Selma movement started, so that's great. So I was going back and forth between Chicago and, uh, and, uh, and, and Selma. So I was recruiting these gang members so that they could be, and I was training them in Chicago and then sending them to uh, Selma as marshals because hmm. they already had teeth knocked out, you know, and black eyes and bricks thrown at them. So that didn't bother them. They were great marshals because they had experience with, you know, dealing with missiles and stuff. So uh, they came back to Chicago and we got them ready. They were the ones who escorted us on those Chicago marches oh, wow. in Gage Park and places like that, okay? So uh, I got very close to Martin Luther King and when he came to Chicago as well, and he sent me to Rochester, New York with his staff and he just started treating me as if I was a staff person. Of course, the uh, service committee, they allowed me to go because they wanted to support Martin Luther King. And then finally, uh, he decided that he wanted me to come to uh, Atlanta, because he's going to reorganize his organization. So uh, in those days, you know, we <clears throat> learn how to uh, be with nonprofit organizations, and so I asked Dr. King for a job description. <laughs> 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 he said, "That's why I want you to come down here, <laughs> <laughs> so you can help write the job description." So uh, he called me back again, and he said. Um, so I told him I needed to get a letter, you know, of invitation or something, you know. I was trying to be, you know, really. Uh, but anyway, he said, uh, come on down here. I said, okay. So I did. And he appointed me the head of his staff. I was the national program administrator. And I was only 27 years old. And Martin Luther King wanted me to supervise Jim Bevel. Jose Williams, Dorothy Cotton, and Jesse Jackson. Okay? I was their supervisor. Wow. Then, two weeks later, he appointed me as the um, national coordinator for his Poor People's Campaign. And, uh, of course, when we went to uh, Memphis, we were having a staff meeting, and they sent for Martin Luther King. He really didn't want to go to Memphis, but his friends called him. So they really need you because these sanitation workers, you know, their their spirits are waning, and they've been so t tired, and they don't want to get any results. So if you could just come up for a day and talk to them and stimulate them and make a speech and have a press conference, that would give them more energy and determination. So that's why Martin Luther King went. He hadn't planned to stay there, but once it got broken up in violence, he decided to stay. But he was scheduled to go to a press conference, and I was the one that he sent. He said, no, uh, I want you to have this press conference and open up the campaign office, 14th and U in D.C. So I got the press statement together, uh, and so he, he and I were working on that the night before when he made the mountaintop speech. Mm -hmm. He was already in bed. With his pajamas, he was exhausted, very tired. I never seen Martin Luther King so tired. And he got this phone call, and they said, "No, this is your crowd." Because when we got there, and this is Abernathy talking, he said the people just got so excited and euphoric, and when they discovered that you were not there, uh, Martin Luther King, they their feathers fell. So uh, you got to come. So he got up, went out. No preparation, you know, and made that mountaintop speech. So he came back, and the next morning, the last words Martin Luther King said to me after we finished the press statement, I was going to be headed to Washington. He said, now Lafayette, and he called me Lafayette because uh, Bernard Lee was the other person who traveled with Martin Luther King. Uh, it was the Bernard, and I was the Lafayette. So uh, he said, 
the next movement we're going to have is to internationalize and institutionalize nonviolence, comma, to be discussed. When I arrived in Washington, D.C., no ride was at the airport. I said, what in the world? So I called the office and there was a riot. Stokely Carmichael and Walter Fontroy were out on the streets there at 14th and U trying to quell the riot because Martin Luther King had been shot. I called back. I called the UPI, United Press International, and I called AP. In those days they had banks of phones in the airport and I had one phone and one there. The UPI reporter was reading off the ticker tape and he broke down in tears. I could hear him sniffling and that's when I found out Martin Luther King was dead. Mm. So I called back and they told me, I called back to Memphis and they told me to meet him in Atlanta. And so we had to do a funeral and we had to do the sanitation workers uh, strike and then the poor people's campaign without Martin Luther King. So that was the last campaign. I, you know, we, we are, um, we've got about a minute and 30 seconds left, and, oh. and, and I feel like I could talk to you for a month. Um, Easily. One of the, and I don't know if you can do this quickly, but you, one of the things that you said earlier is that, you know, love overpowers hate. Fifty years after Martin Luther King Jr.'s death, uh, and we've seen a new surge of hate, is the recipe, is the counter to that more love? Yes. And this is an opportunity for us to use the forces that are already in place. We have centers all around the world. Martin Luther King, we teach King in nonviolence. And we help people learn how to uh, manage their conflicts. Conflict will not disappear and go away, okay? And sometimes conflict is good. It's educational. It helps to sharpen us up in many ways, uh, be clear about things. So what we want to be able to do is to manage that conflict and make the best use out of it, okay? Couldn't even drive a car if it didn't have some conflict with the spark plugs. Mm -hmm. Got to get some spark going, <laughs> okay? So um, this is an opportunity for us now to put it in, in action kind of thing you're talking about, history repeats itself. Mm -hmm. We had the reconstruction period. So as we repeat, let's continue to use what we've learned also in terms of that repeat of history. Bernard Lafayette, uh, thank you so much for being with us. It's an inspiration to us and we really do appreciate it. Your book is In Peace and Freedom, My Journey in Selma, and we recommend it to everyone. That's all the time we have this week, but if you want to know more about story, check us out on Facebook and Twitter. He's Wayne, I'm Jim. We hope you'll join us again next week. <laughs>